Center. Um, we still have people going through the line but in the essence of time. We're going to go ahead and get going. Um, in doing so, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to our Morris Bank Lunch and Learn and, and thank the industry leaders for appearing today to take some questions. But before we get started, I'm going to ask Mr. Cliff Wilds to come back and give thanks. Thank you, God. If you would, please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings. Dear Lord, we thank you for this community, the opportunities uh, for, for future growth, the, the prospects that, uh, that are laid before us. Dear Lord, we ask for your wisdom in the decision-making process. We, we ask for your guidance that uh, the decisions we make will be in what's best for our community and uh, we'll, we'll, your will be done through those decisions, dear Lord. As we partake of this food, dear Lord, we ask that you bless it, bless those that you have prepared it, and please nourish our bodies so that we may serve you better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, as some of y'all are still coming through the line, please know there's some seats up here and also right here, and there's also places you can fill in as well. A little housekeeping, I want to thank uh, Travis Phillips, the famous chef, for providing lunch today. Y'all could have been around the clock. So a lot of y'all might be wondering why are you here today? And as a community bank, there was a group of them once that wanted to come together and figure out a way to give something back to the community um, and to our customers, to help y'all um, hear from our key industry leaders about the growth that is happening and growth that will be coming that's been announced over the past 12 months. Um, I would like to thank the county and city for all their hard work leading up to this moment, from laying infrastructure out to 301 I-16 uh, Park, and just everything they've done to get us for, for getting ready for this amount of growth. Uh, the format today will be, uh, we'll have people come up and ask questions to uh, these key industry leaders about questions y'all have submitted uh, prior to this meeting. Uh, if you have a question that does come up during the meeting, you'll be able to text a number that is, uh, that we put up here. There it is. Some of y'all might recognize that number, so be careful what you text. So. <clears throat> but the time is allowed. We will uh, go through those questions. If we don't have time at the end of the session, we will get those questions to these leaders and then they'll give us the response so we can get back to you. So if you do text, please have an email address with that text. Uh, in doing so, I would like to uh, kick it off and uh, go through short introductions. I'm going to hand the mic off to uh, Dr. Benji Thompson. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Benji Thompson. I'm the CEO of the Development Party of Bolt County. Um, the Development Authority's primary mission is uh, business recruitment, large business recruitment. Our mission includes support for existing industry too in Bullock County. We serve both the city and the county in that role. Uh, most of what we do, however, uh, our, our traditional role has been with manufacturing and distribution, which means most of our activity takes place outside the city limits, but uh, we have a very strong partnership with both city and county government, so I uh, appreciate the chance to be here with you. Thanks, John. Uh, Stuart Gregory, I'm the Director of Business Development for Bullock Solutions. Uh, our primary line of business is uh, fiber optic internet. Uh, we've been in the telephone internet business since 1951. We have roughly about 2,800 miles of buried fiber in the county and in the city. Uh, and our primary focus uh, is making sure we have enough internet for all the new people that are coming. Uh, Tom Rivera, president of Georgia Southern, uh, representing 25,506 students, uh, 2,800 full-time employees, three campuses, uh, 141 programs of study, over our $1 billion annual economic impact to the region, uh, and uh, uniquely positioned from our public impact research agenda on advanced manufacturing and logistics, uh, uh, coastal resilience, uh, community vibrancy, uh, health and uh, wellness. Uh, I think to lead us into this next stage and proud to be here and part of Statesboro. Thanks for your Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lori Durk. I feel kind of silly introducing myself to you all because I've been here for about 30 years and then there's everyone in the room. 
doing my best to make this panel look a little bit better this morning. <laughs> um, I'm president of UG Technical College, where I have been president there for going on six years. Um, all of you know what UG Tech, our mission is obviously to train the workforce um, for tomorrow, not only for this county, but in the region. You know, most of the jobs in this community, um, there's jobs that you come in at the entry level that require really no skills past a high school uh, education. And then there are jobs that require bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree, which is what Kyle takes care of. But then there's that middle section, what we call middle skilled employees. And that is where the UT Tech comes in. We have about 2,100 students that are on the credit side of the house, which is through our academic programs. But what many people don't know is that we serve another about 2,500 on our non-credit side of the house through continuing education and contract training. So all total about 5,500 a year. Um, and we're excited about the opportunities that are being presented to this community and look forward to working with all these folks up here with them. Uh, good morning. I'm Charles Wilson. I'm the superintendent of Bullock County Schools. And I'm uh, in my 11th year as superintendent, and I've been in the community quite a while. So I'm not sure I'm as old as dirt, but um, I've been around almost a long time. So um, I, uh, again, it's good to be here. And again, I know what the school system it seems obvious as to what the school system is about. I mean, I'm just educating the students in our community. But we do take a very intentional um, focus with that. And trying to ensure that we prepare all of our students for a successful career in life. You know, at some point, you stop going to school to go to work, at least hopefully, right? Um, so whatever that journey is, we're trying to make sure that we prepare our students to, to be prepared, um, and that's everything from the hard skills to the soft skills uh, to the extent we can do. Um, and uh, we're looking at this from a, a, a pull line, not a push line. Um, we try to work very closely with our partners in the industry and education to make sure that we're looking downrange as to what those opportunities are and then sort of backward mapping and aligning that is what we offer in our school district. Um, and then, of course, trying to help our students find what works for them. So, on top of all that, we also try to be very cognizant of the fact that we're responsible for a large amount of resources in this, in this community and try to be very responsible for that. So, um, that's, that's what wraps up, you know, sort of the big idea of what we do. Um, and we work very closely with all of these folks, and obviously we'll be, we'll be doing much more of that. And we're currently a little over 10,000 students. Uh, likely that will uh, change exponentially here in the next few years. And uh, we'll be obviously working together to address that. So we're really excited about the opportunities, and appreciate all of you. Thank you. My name is Stephen Pinnick. I'm CEO of the East Georgia Regional Medical Center. I uh, came in July of 19, so I've been here about three and a half years, right before the COVID pandemic kind of hit. So um, it's nice to get out and see people without wearing a mask um, and see smiles. Um, my, my role is to try to make East Georgia Regional Medical Center the best community hospital in the country, and that's what we're striving for this every day. Thank you. Share a mic today, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to our very own Casey Hagen to uh, start going through our first set of questions. Casey. Thank you all for being here. Um, just as a reminder, there are some note cards, so if you don't want your text, your questions text, you can write those down or write your email address on the note card. Our first set of questions is for residential home and infrastructure. Um, our first question is directed to Benji Thompson. In what areas of the county are current economic growth projections now centered in, and are there other areas for which growth is being considered? Um, thanks, Casey. Um, um, first, very quickly, uh, one of the personal privilege. I have two board members with us today, Billy Allen and Doug Lambert. Guys, you raise your hands. Thank you very much. Um, people ask me from time to time, particularly over the course of the last 12 months or so, um, about the success we've been having, and I tell them it's based on really three things, and that's good decisions, uh, or persistent work with some patients involved, I guess that's the fourth thing, and uh, some good fortune. And uh, Billy and Doug have been there every step of the way. We have an outstanding board with the development authority. And I'll mention one other person. Uh, Don said something about the city and the county coming together to extend utilities to the interstate. And let me tell you that if it weren't for Bruce Young getting in a room with people and saying this is what you need to do, it never would have happened. So 
Uh, we miss Bruce terribly, and he was a wonderful person in this community and deserves so much credit for the things that are happening now. Um, I'm sorry, back to your question. Um, the places where economic growth is being projected, I'll tell you that I am not the expert on uh, retail growth or residential growth. I'll try to limit my comments to the industrial recruitment that we work with with the Development Authority. Um, but for us, the growth is primarily along the 301 South Corridor between the city and the interstate. Um, there, because of the, the fact that utilities do exist in that area. We've got access to city water, city sewer, city natural gas. It's a four lane industrial grade road. It's an easy move to the interstate. Um, and economic development since interstates have existed have been the place where economic development tends to happen. So that corridor is what we count, we uh, focus on, particularly for manufacturing growth because of the ability of utilities there. Uh, now, other places in the county where growth is likely to happen, and particularly those of you in, in the industries represented here <clears throat> know about as well as I do, and that is um, along the I-16 corridor. Um, up and down the interstate at the exits and on the roads and, and the properties that are close to exits or close to the interstate. Uh, before Hyundai ever came around, the Port of Savannah was driving growth in this region. And we were seeing that any time you drove to Savannah, as you drove past the interstate center, industrial park in Ryan County, or anything from there towards Savannah, you saw big buildings, big boxes popping up on either side of the interstate. That's been going on for several years. Um, and it was moving its way towards Bullock County when Hyundai made its decision. Not, Hyundai's not going to stop that. So you'll see more growth along that corridor. Um, you, I, I really didn't mention the 67 corridor, um, kind of on purpose uh, for industrial growth. There are some, uh, there's a lot of commercial type growth that's likely to happen in 67. We're not spending a lot of our time on the 67 corridor. We see that kind of evolving itself without us being involved. Um, but that, in a nutshell, is where we're seeing that kind of growth. <coughs> Did anyone else want to ask you that? The second question, will the growth from industry that is being projected for Bullock County also carry possible growth in the residential se sector, i.e. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the short answer is yes. Um, what a lot of people, right after Hyundai was announced, uh, and Hyundai was announced with 8,100 jobs. And I would talk to people very shortly after the announcement. They'd say, where are we going to put 8,000 people? And my response to that is, it won't be 8,000 people. Most of the people that go to work at the Hyundai plant already live here. Um, the vast majority of people who will work for Hyundai already live in the region. Um, now, they're going to move from the jobs they have now to Hyundai, and they're going to have to be backfilled jobs. And new people will absolutely move to the region. New people will absolutely move to the southern part of the county because it's within a handful of miles of the Hyundai plant. So there will be uh, residential growth here, no doubt. Um, there will be significant growth in the city of Statesboro, um, particularly from the Hyundai suppliers that are gonna locate in Bullock County. We've talked to uh, the Korean owners of those suppliers and they want their people to live uh, in more dense type situations, townhomes, condominiums, that kind of thing. Uh, they don't want the upkeep of a, a yard or, or those kinds of things. They want to live uh, in a different kind of situation, and they want to be closer to amenities. So I think the city of Statesboro and uh, the density that's closer to the city center is going to benefit from that. But there will absolutely be residential growth in Bullock County. We're not 100% sure where it will be, but we think it will be most likely in the southern end and around the city. Third question, baby. <laughs> <laughs> What concerns have you heard from citizens in response to the projected economic growth in Bullock County? Um, I'd like to throw that to the audience. What are the two things that you hear most? Where are the workers going to come from? Where are people going to live? Those are the two biggies that we hear all the time. Um, we were asked that question on the Friday morning that Hyundai made their announcement. Um, in all four of the counties that were involved, uh, Chad and Brian and Ethan as well. And the, the first answer was, we don't know. We don't know where the work's gonna come from. Um, where people gonna live, we don't know. Um, those are honest answers. If you know me at all, you know I, I'll tell you exactly what I'm thinking. Um, but the fact of the matter is, that's the way it is whenever there's growth. You don't know. You've got faith, and you believe in the people who are in a position to affect it, and you work with those people to make it better. But you really don't know in the beginning. Now, to try to help you feel a little bit better about it, uh, we're all, in, particularly in the four counties, working to address both of those questions. 
Uh, the Joint Development Authority has engaged a labor consulting firm to help us understand what situation we have in the four county region with workforce and what the strategies to do something about it. You can feel good about your county because uh, I can speak for the Development Authority, but in partnership between the Development Authority, the Beach Tech, and the school system, we've been working for 10 years on a workforce development plan that's kind of evolved itself over time, but we've been trying to work to create our own workforce through uh, the K-12 system. So we've been working on this for a long time. Um, we recognize, and, and those of you who are employers, you know this better than I do, you know that there's a scarcity issue with workforce. You do, you know a whole lot better than me. I have one employee and I can't fill that spot. So <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Um, So we know there's, there are gonna be issues, but we feel like the, the growth and the opportunities here will help people have more of a reason to stay here. It will help people have a reason to move here, whether it's Bullitt County or somewhere closer to Savannah. So we know workforce is a big issue. Uh, somebody asked me earlier today about the housing thing. Um, and, and this room and this, gosh, this building is named for the people that are gonna help address that question. Um, if, if there is an opportunity, a financial opportunity for home builders and developers, you're gonna figure out how to make it happen. My bigger concern is how are we gonna manage that type of growth to maintain the quality of life of the place we call home. Um, you know, some people who have my jobs, they go to work there, they announce a few projects, and then they move to the next place. I've lived here since 1984. Um, I, I, would, I would like for states from Bullock County to maintain the quality of life that we appreciate too, along with the growth that comes. So those are our challenges, workforce housing. Uh, we'll continue working on those with, with the other leadership in the community, and, and, uh, and those, those are the things we've got to do. <coughs> And this last question, we'll piggyback on a comment that you just made. What can the community do to help for better prepare Bullock County for the growth projected? Thanks, Casey. I think part of it is being involved in things like this. I really appreciate Morris Bank doing this for the community. There, there are a lot of conversations out there about Hyundai, about the suppliers. Um, people think that we're going to have 10,000 Koreans all living in Statesboro next week. Um, <laughs> Earlier this morning I said, uh, good afternoon everybody, it was like 11.45, but I was looking at my Korea watch, it's afternoon tomorrow in Korea. Um, but every, we, everybody is, we've got different things being discussed out in the community. Becoming informed is extremely important. Um, asking questions of the people that are involved in this. I mean, if you see me in the street, ask me what's going on. If there are things I can't tell you, I'll tell you I can't tell you. But if, if there are things that I just, uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, what's going on because it's very exciting. Um, but the most important thing is just to become informed. The second thing I'd ask everybody to do, and, and this is a good audience to say this to because um, you're a group of business people and development people and, and, and you know how these things work. Accept the fact that change is coming. Um, and I, I spoke with Juan about a month ago and um, I, I remember telling him, listen, I was born and raised in Melvin Jenkins County and I know there are a few of us in the room. Um, we can have change like that, or we can have change like this, but we can't choose whether or not change is going to happen. So let's accept that fact, and then let's figure out a way to leverage it for the better, the best we can for this community. And that includes new, better jobs and opportunities. That includes housing. That includes education. That includes a lot of stuff. So if you can be the leaders in the community that say, hey, good stuff's coming, um, then that would be very helpful to all of us who are kind of in the world that. Thank you, Vincent, for answering those questions. I'll give you a break. <laughs> uh, Stuart, um, thank you again for being here. Is Bullet Solutions able to meet the demand that the incoming industries generate? <laughs> um, uh, short answer is yes. Um, so uh, some people 20 years ago at, at where I work made some really awesome decisions about what the future looked like. And that has held us in good stead to, to this day. And one of those things is right now, um, we are built to uh, go up 10x on capacity. Um, we are only buying uh, about 100 gig to the outside world. And right now, peak demand is about 42 gig. So we could literally double our customer base before we even hit capacity. And then could go up 10 more times. Um, just by buying access, it, like buying water uh, at, at the end of the day. Um, and so absolutely we can handle it um, and 
I'm real fortunate for those people 20 years ago. Because it would be a different answer. Thank you. What challenges do you currently face in providing services to Bullet Time residents? Mm. Um, currently, we don't really face too many, you know, um, challenges other than the challenges that everybody else faces. You know, uh, cost of materials is obviously uh, high for us. Uh, most of our equipment includes, you know, semiconductor chips and, and all that stuff. Um, so, as far as challenges currently, we don't have many uh, in preparation for a huge influx of new customers. Um, for the past six months, we've been uh, shoring up our network. We hired some engineers from outside to come in and, and um, add multiple layers of redundancy. Um, we uh, work with our vendors to go for the 10x expansion, and then um, we also added um, some automated monitoring and automated uh, correction services that we start uh, started yesterday that will be live in March that will maintain the network as it were and uh, ensure that uh, we have a minimal amount of outages other than when um, utility workers cut our fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question. Will Bullet Solutions be utilized for providing service to any industry outside of the company? Yes, uh, 100%. So um, for obvious privacy reasons, I can't say who, where, when, and what, um, but we've already picked up um, three of the manufacturing facilities and a couple of the satellite vendors that will uh, support that. Um, we have uh, fiber uh, uh, all the way down the 16 corridor, all the way down 301, all the way down 67, all the way down 80. Um, you know, our primary service area is out in the county and it has been for 72 years. So um, any of that growth and development that will happen, we're uh, already there. Thank you, Stuart. I'd like to introduce Brandon Smith. He will be conducting the next presentation. All right. <clears throat> Thank you all again for coming. I'm going to ask some questions that are going to be uh, centered around commercial and corporate development. <clears throat> and Benji, I'm sorry, we haven't been settled here for a couple of questions. So, um, the first question is Are the existing industrial parks in Hillet County at capacity? Thanks, um, Brandon. Mostly. We have um, two. Um, one mature industrial park in another kind of area of the county where we have industrial property. The Gateway Regional Industrial Park, which we've had since the mid 90s, uh, Walmart, DC, Riggs and Pratt, and uh, those, great name. We have um, a little over 100 acres remaining in that park. Uh, that park for us, are, um, the, the difficulty with that park, it's not a difficulty, it's just uh, the fact that we're seven miles away from the interstate makes it a little less desirable for those that desire the interstate. Um, we have the interstate property, the Bruce Young Commerce Park at I 16301. That is full. Cool. We've got nothing left. Um, that has been a, a great success story over the last year or so that we filled that up. And uh, we purchased some property along the 301 corridor, and that is gone. Um, it's been a very successful year for the development authority. So uh, we are, um, you know, I tell myself, I, I don't know what else is coming, but in, in, in the economic development world, you've got to be thinking 10, 15, 20 years down the road to be prepared for what comes next. So that'll be the next uh, set of properties that we'll look at. Thank you. And then along those lines of growth, <clears throat> what are the types of commercial and industrial developments that you see that seem to be most interested in Bullet County? Well, the obvious ones right now are Hyundai related and distribution related. Um, we announced the Hyundai project on May the 20th. The next week, I started getting calls from Hyundai suppliers every day. And from the end of May until um, the present time, we've got Korean visitors in Bullitt County every week. Um, it's funny, the number of people who will call me on their way from the interstate back towards town, and they'll say, there are these people out looking at your property. And I said, yeah. Um, so it's just been very, very, very busy. We've had, we've had a great year because of Hyundai. Uh, which, by the way, uh, this group needs to know, we've been involved with Brown County Megasite since 2014. Uh, we've, we've known and hoped that something like this was coming and that we would reap some benefits from that. So it's a, that's another good success story. So Hyundai-related uh, types of, of uh, projects, we have probably made ourselves through the first wave of Hyundai suppliers. Um, there have only been three announced Hyundai suppliers so far. Bullitt County's had two of them, which is awesome. 
Um, there are two or three more to be announced. We know where they're going, but that hasn't been made public yet. Uh, there are another couple in that wave, and we're involved in at least one of those two. Uh, but then we'll be able to catch a breath, and then some smaller suppliers will, will likely start looking in the region. And they'll look a, a little further out from the from the meth plant, from the mega site in Bryan County. The second group are distribution related. Um, and as I said earlier today, um, that that move was coming. Yeah, since I've had this job uh, almost, well, a little over 12 years now, I remember people in the beginning of the time I, I came here said, we gotta get distribution, gotta get it. And my response a lot of times was, we'll get it when Effingham and Bryan County fill up. Because uh, proximity is the number one thing for the port related stuff. They want to be closest to the port. So we've seen that happen. We've seen a lot of the land particularly uh, either get too wet to use or too expensive to use. And, and those projects are starting to look further away from the port than they used to. So we're seeing some of that um, in Bullock County. A lot of that's being driven, driven by private developers, not so much by the state or by the development authority, but those are the two types that we're going to right now. Thank you for that. And in talking about that growth, what impact do you see that these new industries will have on existing industries and business, in particular with the cost, regards to the cost of labor? Well, <laughs> um, um, there, there's no doubt that labor costs are going to rise. Um, that's how supply and demand works, Steve. Um, you know, when there's a scarcity of the supply, the cost goes up, and, and that's what you, you all as employers have been living with, particularly since COVID. So certainly labor costs will rise. Um, on the good side, the positive side of that, we think that will raise the standard of living for people who live in our community. And that's the reason why we do this, is to give people opportunity. So uh, that, along with this huge amount of capital investment that will be infused into our community and how that will help with property taxes and other things, uh, those are positives about this effect on, the, on labor costs. On the other side of that, we recognize that um, it's going to be a huge challenge for employers. We know that, and uh, and we're doing the best we can. As I said, we've engaged that consulting firm. Uh, we're going to work with our sister counties and JDA to try to uh, come up with strategies to help even more. The Joint Development Authority has hired a workforce director uh, to work for primarily Hyundai, but she'll work in all four counties. She'll spend time in Bullock County too. So. Um, there's going to be an impact, um, but we think that working together we can smooth it out as best we can. Thank you. All right, last question on commercial corporate development, and Benji, I'm not going to pick on you solely, so the rest of the panel, y'all can chime in on this one if you'd like, but what percentage of the needed workforce can be obtained locally versus skilled labor moving into the area to fill positions? Um, the, my first answer to that is I don't know. I'm not sure um, if we can have all the skilled people from Bullock County, but what I do know is that we always have had needs. Uh, if, you've, if you're an employer here, you've got people from Bullock County that work for you, and there's, there's a really good chance you've got people who don't live in Bullock County that work for you. Uh, that's particularly true with manufacturing. Uh, with large employers. There are going to be people from outside of town that, that drive here to work. But you know, if you've lived in Bullock County for any period of time, you know that we're blessed by the fact that people come here to work and to shop and to go to the hospital and to do other things. So it is, I think, a more positive thing than a negative thing that people come from outside of the, of the jurisdiction. And, and I say jurisdiction because economic development doesn't care about jurisdictional lines. You create opportunities for people, they're gonna take advantage of that, of that opportunity however far they're willing to drive or, or commute to get here. And that's okay. Um, I will tell you that the vast majority of the jobs will be taken down by Bullock Countyans uh, because they're closer. That proximity is a great thing. Um, I, I would argue that we need to have labor from adjacent communities come here. And I think as employers, you understand that too. That goes back to that supply and demand thing. You'd rather be able to choose from people from other places to come here and work. Uh, one last comment about that's related to this, um, and it's, it's also connected to the Hyundai supplier decisions. Um, in 2014, two of us of the four counties said at El Sombrero, we came up with the JDA idea for the Bryan County Mega Site. And I told my colleague at that time, I said, I want to be, uh, I want to be able to get back from whatever it locates there. If we put Bullock County puts money in it, I want to be able to get that money back out at some point in time. 
And the second thing I want Bullock County to have is a special place for suppliers. We want to be treated specially for suppliers. But at that time, we knew that we were 30 miles away from the mega site at our industrial property. And suppliers for automotive OEMs have to be close, but they want to be as far away as they can be, but still be as close as they have to be. And that made Bullock County a great place for suppliers to look at. Now, part of the reason why they want to be as far away from the, the mother plant as they can be, but still be close enough, is because they get to take advantage of workforce that's not just in that community. They can go to other places. They can have a more competitive situation with workforce. So let's leverage that as Bullock County to make the best of it. I think that's what we're going to want to do. Sure, I'll just add to that. I think we have a part to play in this also. It's not a finite answer to that question based on a percentage. I think our proactive nature of what we do in readiness now for the next 30 years can dictate that balance. Because uh, as Benji said, at least for our quality of life, we want people that are living here uh, that are going to school here, that are part of our community, that's not a bedroom community. And so our readiness in that is everything from infrastructure to educational attainment opportunity, also community vibrancy, uh, retail, dining, all the other parts of it that make it a place we, we want to attract families to them. Migration has to be a key part of this. Uh, I know from the JEA, at least from what we've heard from the planning, they're looking at the Eastern Corridor, Ohio, Midwest, uh, Texas, uh, I guess in New Texas, for people to migrate here based on the job needs. But to Benji's point, and you know, I've got nearly 3,000 employees, 50% of which make less than $60,000 a year, which is the seven, eight, and hundred. So when we think of that competitive aspect of the employment and employees that I have and the opportunities to fill those jobs, it is very much game on for all of us, but, but that will elevate all ships, but we have to prepare ourselves as a county uh, in my mind, holistically, uh, if we're going to have a, a part in a hand in terms of what this looks like at the end of this growth cycle. Okay. <laughs> I'll just say on that, I, I agree with Vince. I don't know even what percentage. What I do know is this. Um, we just hope to, to employ as many of our local, I mean, you think about it, as many students that we have coming out of our public school system, and you're talking. 10,000 students plus more. There are abundance of opportunities for people who want to pursue, pursue work. Whether they want to go to a Yishu Tech and then go to work, or whether they want to go straight to work. The opportunities are going to be there. It's going to have to be, it's really going to come down to um, willfulness and determination and intent of people. And I think that's upon us as a community to set that expectation for our, for our community. <coughs> I think we all know we live in a society where there's a, gen there's a big generational gap on understanding of what work ethic and pursuit of those kinds of things might be. I mean, we're all seeing it. Uh, I think what we have to see, help, help them see is there are opportunities, but you must apply yourself toward it, whether that's hard skills or soft skills or whatever it is. So I think we, the answer to that is we all know that as many as we can possibly fill from this community, that's just going to be better for this community. So I think we, we do have a lot of positive perspective. So I think it's not an effort. <laughs> uh, and what we're hearing anecdotally from other communities that have this major influx uh, of workforce need is they've met the initial uh, uh, sustainability in terms of at the beginning uh, of the major projects coming through three to five years, but it's sustained that beyond that has been the greater challenge in some ways. So as we begin our planning, if we work through this, that will be part of what we're, we're thinking about projecting. Thank y'all very much for that. Now I'm going to turn it over to Elaine Averitt for our next set of questions. Thank you, Grant. Um, I'm going to follow him right along with the questions that were just asked. I have the pleasure today to ask the questions that have been submitted in regards to education and workforce development. And as you know, we have such a strong and growing public school system, incredible Eastern Technical College and Georgia Southern University right here in our area. Um, so with that, I'm going to start the questions with Dr. Morera. Uh, Dr. Morera, the, the first question submitted was, is Georgia Southern University focused on recruiting for particular majors based on the announcement offers? Well, thanks. So first, I want to thank Morris Bank for inviting us here. I think this is exactly what we need to be doing, having these type of forums. So thank you for that. Um, you know, and, and I got all 
also say we work so well together. We have an education collaborative with, with uh, Okichi, with the uh, Holy County Public School System, with our chamber, uh, with the developmental board. We meet monthly. We've been doing this for three years, readying ourselves for that pipeline. We call it employed and old or enlisted. That every 18 year old, uh, through our actions, our preparedness, is either going to lead to take getting welding, the HVAC, whatever it's needed, skilled labor, or coming to us on those articulation agreements with that. That's the key for us to work together. The majors for us, look, we already have a lot of majors. We have 141 programs of study, and just to highlight a few, we are the only advanced manufacturing engineering program in the state of Georgia, in fact, the only one in 500 miles. We have a full array of all the engineering in the spectrum, the mechanical, electrical, civil. Uh, we have construction engineering, we have logistics supply chain, all the way through our world, all the full business array, education, uh, 50% of the educators in the five county region of Georgia are graduates with the educator and educators health professions. One out of every 500 graduate degree in the health professions in the state of Georgia is a Georgia South graduate. We're a leader in those areas. We'll continue to wrap up and ramp those up. Uh, I think that's another follow-up question that I can give some answers there. But for us, it is that alignment. What I'm really excited about, particularly with Hyundai, uh, which is a little different. I was the president of the University of West Georgia in Carrollton. From 2013 to 2019, and the Kia plant, which was you know West Point, uh, just to our sort of south and, and west, really didn't hire four-year to grant to grant a degree uh, employees. They were hiring skilled labor. It's very different with Hyundai. We've already had a job there. They've already made ten offers of employment to our engineering students that have just graduated or graduated the last year. So. This is already a pipeline. We're working at internships specifically around construction engineering, electrical engineering, manufacturing engineering. So we're already seeing partnerships and relevance for four-year degrees. And that's really new and exciting for us, particularly for the entire growth sector. So those job fairs, the internships, and as I mentioned earlier, our public impact research agenda is, is critical. I, I know that doesn't feel tangible to you all necessarily as a direct output of, of, of you know, Square peg, square hole. Uh, but what it means is everything that we're doing in discovery and applied research, everything we're doing in that patented, patented technology around uh, technology solutions to supply chain, around water resilience, water quality, updating the predictive analysis of the of the uh, Florida aquifer and water use. As Benji knows, the only way we grow is water availability, and we're at the forefront at Georgia Southern. So those are our critical intersections. It will be our role in a future economic growth. What programs does Georgia Southern offer related to the healthcare industry? And are there any plans, if so, to expand those? Yeah, so our largest college, uh, over 5,000 students, um, already gave me one stat, one out of five uh, undergraduate degrees is uh, Georgia Southern graduate in health professions. <laughs> Uh, for us, it's the full array, nursing, health informatics, uh, uh, anesthesiology. Uh, we have a full array of physical therapy, uh, uh, radiological sciences, rehab sciences, respiratory therapy, sports management. Have that full array. Those are continuing growth. In fact, we have invested in expanding our nursing cohort to at the output end. Uh, Steve and I talk about this a lot. It's critical. Uh, nurses, obviously, our BSN nurses, our partnership with the R and the BSN, and then all that we do, our accelerated BSN. Uh, we're on a process now. We produce about 340 licensed nurses a year now. Um, our goal is to get up to 400. We're at 300 uh, two and a half years ago, and our goal is to add 33 percent to 400 within a five-year period, and we're on that trajectory so far. We're also going to be launching a PA program, a physician's assistance program. Uh, we're going to try to fast track it through our process. Uh, some of the news that's in process is two years uh, from now. And if all the stars align, uh, that we do doing a limited cohort program, but we're looking to make a pipeline from our BSN right into uh, PA. And there's some other needs on the horizon that I think will be really exciting in our role, specifically in the health industry and healthcare, and expanding our our offerings. Well, I alluded to it a little bit, and, and one is, you know, we, we many of you know, we, we uh, people here at, at, you know, at this table, um, and, and others got together on November 9th and 10th. Uh, we really, Benji and I, and Lori, and, and Charles, and, and Charles, and uh, Tom Couch, and everybody wanted to come together.
together and at least start to put a framework around what readiness would look like. And so for us, our role obviously is workforce education, being a community partner in that, but it's also a catalyst as the major employer, uh, one of the major employers and our ability to have impact on the region. So with that, out of it came this framework of really nothing earth shattering, everything you're talking about, infrastructure, workforce readiness, our, our, our insurance around that, that we have vibrant communities, places that people want to live, shop, play, et cetera, and then the communication strategy. So we built that framework, we're all committed to moving forward. So that's a type of partnership. You know, what we do is a mission that I think is going to be critical to move this forward. The others are education collaborative. Uh, we've been doing that for three years, as I said. That's really where we have the chance every month to work together in that pipeline, our pathways of prosperity that Charles is doing. Uh, it, it's so critical, and that skill building and everything that Lori's going to talk about is critical. We have our role, but we all have to help each other in that. And what we have to ensure is no one feels stuck. We don't want the German model where an eighth or ninth grader feels like there's no way they can ever go from a technical uh, career to then four year to be granted. So we're building those pathways and they've been great partnerships. So that's where I see our role. We've got about 100 million uh, facility expansion renovation going on right now, complication center. We'll find it great ground, praise the Lord. Uh, supply chain, but it should be done by fall of 2024. That'll be our new arena. Uh, we call it a complication center for a lot of reasons. Many state will fund it. Uh, but, um, <laughs> and then our indoor practice facility should be completed uh, in April. Uh, Williams Center is going under significant renovations. Uh, you'll notice University Villas was demolished and we'll have more parking. Parking is very exciting to us on campus, so we're excited about that. And then we have a new project, our baseball renovations uh, that we're doing specifically uh, for that whole uh, left field side uh, that will all be redone over the next few years. So typically when you say based on the announcement, people typically think about the, the kind of programs that lend themselves to manufacturing, right? So of course, um, we have manufacturing engineering technology, welding, um, electrical and industrial system technology. And like Angie said, we've been putting these systems, these programs in place for years. We've been working with manufacturing companies in this region for a very long time. It's why, why we do what we do. Um, and yes, of course, we always need more graduates from those programs. But if you think about the growth that's about happening in this community, with a 99% job placement rate, we need to recruit for all of our current existing programs. Because you think about the influx of uh, the population, um, think about things like automotive technology, construction, uh, electrical systems, uh, veterinary technology, pharmacy, technology, I mean, all the things that make a community run culinary. So we have the programs in place that are needed to sustain this community and help it grow. We just need more people to train because we can't turn them out fast enough and we seem to not be able to turn out enough of them. Okay, so um, automotive, Ben can probably chime in on this, automotive assembly, I mean, you know, these plants of these of today are very automated. So um, probably two of the programs that are going to be really important um, when it comes to automobile assembly is our robotics program as well as our industrial maintenance program. So if you, I don't know if there's any manufacturers in the room, but when you think about manufacturers, industrial maintenance is the two buzzwords that are important, the most important to them. So you think about how engineers design this elaborate manufacturing um, line, it is up to those industrial uh, maintenance technicians to keep it running. And they are aging out at a rapid, at a rapid pace. Um, I think the average age is about 65. So these are the folks that know a little bit about a lot. Electrical, mechanical, uh, hydraulics, uh, PLC. 
So that program is um, obviously very important. So those are the two that we would focus on the manufacturing side. But also we're adding a um, electric vehicle te uh, technician program to our list of, um, of uh, offerings, not necessarily because of this announcement, just because that's what you're seeing more and more on the road. And I just want to reiterate what Casey said earlier, as you guys have been talking, I've been taking the questions, more questions to ask. So if you think of anything, there's a, you know, a little index card on your table that you can fill out, leave your email address and leave it on the table, and we'll make sure to follow up with those answers in the next week or so to come. Um, with, with the growth, you know, a lot of our attendees see the growth in the health care industry, and can you tell us about the programs that you have here? Sure. So um, probably if you add up all of our allied health programs, it represents probably our largest percentage of enrollment. Um, I have to make a list of them because I forget. Sometimes I'll leave some out. So we have a CNA, medical assisting, radiologic technology, sonography, echocardiography, EMT, paramedicine, pharmacy technician, dental assist assisting, opticianry, and lastly, nursing, which is obviously very important. So right now we offer an LPN program. Um, this month, we are submitting to the Georgia Board of Nursing to uh, start an ASN program, which will be an RN program, which will also be an LPN to RN, RN Bridge program, um, which is super important for this community. I know that uh, there's, Stephen has a lot of RN positions open, so just so those of you that don't work in healthcare and understanding the difference between um, an ASN, an associate's degree of nursing, and a BSN, which is a Bachelor of Science of Nursing, those are both RA programs. Uh, they both sit for the same state boards. Um, the difference is that typically your BSNs have skills to go on to be a charge nurse or move into management. But both programs will produce RNs, which are such, uh, such a big demand right now. Okay, so Quick Start is a buzzword when you hear about companies um, locating in a community and you know, Quick Start is one of the tools in the toolbox that Benji uses to help recruit companies. So Quick Start um, will help um, uh, be involved in the opening of a, of a facility. They pretty much help hire and train that first wave of employees for free. There's no charge for that. But Quick Start is a division of the Technical College System of Georgia, but it is completely separate from your technical colleges. So with Quick Start, they will actually build a, a training facility at the, um, on the grounds of the Hyundai site and help, they're designed to help companies ramp up um, and hire their initial uh, wave of employees. Um, there's been several Quick Start projects here in Bullitt when Great Dane opened, um, Briggs and Stratton, they uh, expand. So it's a way that there's a kind of a carrot that the state uh, dangles in front of the, uh, prospective companies to help them choose Georgia, and it's working. It's obviously working, with Georgia being the number one place to do business and keeps Benji busy too. Um, but after that way, obviously, they depend on the technical college system to have the programs in place that can then choose graduates to fill uh, those vacancies as they have time. The answer to that is yes. Um, so, uh, Ed, let me just give a little context on that. Um, prior to all this happening, you know, in this community, we were seeing probably one and a half to two percent average growth each year going on in our community. Now, we also we all know also that I was starting to become a little petty on the south end. But I think, uh, as you mentioned this earlier, you know, once Eddie Ham and Brian fill up, same thing in terms of people moving, you know, so, you know just from rising tide coming through. So we knew the South was going to be hit um, you know, more directly. But with this announcement, of course, now we're looking at probably, um, of course, none of us can predict exactly what's going to happen. But based on working with the county and, and some of the projections we're seeing, we're going to see something that we've never seen before. Um, and 
that's going to be a very significant, um, very steady, if not sharp, increase. Um, and it's just going to be a constant, you know, fast rise of the tide. Um, how quickly what it looks like, we, we don't know. You know, you know. But what we do know is it's going to, uh, it's going to impact us. Um, we're trying to work with the county and other agencies in, in, in the predictions of, you know, how many people might be moving in, when and where, um, and preparing for that. That new growth. Now that could be anywhere from eight to fifteen percent. We don't know, but anyway, if you can set that, we can we can uh, kind of aim for that mark, uh, knowing that that's what we're going to be dealing with. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. Do you see the new plan for Southeast Florida High School and Okay, so some of those yet to get sorted out. The answer to the question is uh, the plan we had in place, and I don't know if you all know the details on that, but we had a plan in place for the South Lincoln County of the Living Field Moment you know, to address the growth. And we were trying to do that in a way that would re require the minimal amount of capital outlay expenditure at the same time planning for needs you know, of the growth in the schools. That plan, which we thought would be at least a 10, if not a 15 year plan, maybe 20 year plan, has now become probably about a five year plan. Okay. So, in, in relation to looking long on this um, and working backward, um, we, we, the plan we have there, um, and there may be some changes around that particular plan, that has now become a very short term component of a larger plan that we know that we're going to have to address. Um, you know, in all of this, guys, I think. You know, we know that with the, with the population predictions you know, play out in some rough form, we are, we're going to be looking at either the need for a very large high school or two decently large high schools in the South Lincoln County, not to mention probably twice as many elementary and another middle school. And all that could happen, I'd say 10 to 15, you know, within the next 10 to 15 years now. Where we're going to have to be very patient with ourselves as a community, and I, I know we're all, most of us are like this, so we wouldn't be in this room. We like to plan things out, we like them to fit the way they need to fit, and to work out first. But life doesn't work out like that, and we all know that successful business people, you know, it, it doesn't work out, so you just have to adjust. We are very much going to have to look long in this, we're going to have to work short, we're going to have to be adaptable, we're just going to have to be flexible and work around ourselves. What we, there won't be enough money fast enough to address problems with this problem that's ahead of us. Keep in mind that our outlay, our capital outlay only comes from the East Loss, the Education Special Purpose Local Action Sales Tax. It just got approved every five years we collect upon that. And if you really start looking at the facilities needs based on these population projections, if you start doing the numbers around that and you realize what has to be built, could you look at the average non inflation adjusted numbers. We're going to have to be very careful about the fact that we don't do what feels good or soothes us and is easy and protects this particular interest or that interest and look at the bigger picture in relation to the long term planning. So we're going to be doing that from a point of perspective and then working back on those components. And I do think we're going to have to be flexible and work around ourselves. A question that comes up, I'm going to address it. Oh my gosh, mobile units. Yes. Unfortunately, mobile, mobile classrooms are going to have to be part of the solution. I mean, it's just one of those things that you can't build wings and you know, buildings in the ground fast enough. So we're going to have to work with that as we need. Not the long term plan, but it is going to have to be part of our little toolkit on how we work around ourselves in the process. Well, the answer to that is yes, we have these work and career readiness programs in place um, to support workforce training, but uh, we are, again, thank goodness we're prepared. We, it's not like we're all just waking up and saying, oh my gosh, we need to have a conversation. Uh, we've been doing what we do. We've all been, you know, towards some OGC development, and all of us have been doing what we do. We've been doing that together and having these conversations and change it. Um, so it's not like we're unprepared. However, we are all having to adjust. Uh, right now, we have all all types of things in place. I think you heard Mr. Thompson mention our workforce development plan. That's something that's been going on. Many of you have been involved in that. You know, we have work based learning opportunities for our students. There are some apprenticeships, but that's sort of limited at the moment. That has to do with more of an industry requirement. Um, 
you know, we have multiple career pathways which are safe to find and we can adjust them within our district. Um, we have partnerships with industry, higher ed, development authority, all of these things you've heard about. But what's really important here are those career pathways. And you heard Lord Durden talking about that a moment ago, somewhat from the, the technical college perspective. In preparing the students, we work with the Beecher Tech and Georgia Southern and providing these dual enrollment opportunities for our students. There are a lot of students that are looking to come straight out of school and go to work. And what we are going to have to seriously re engineer now is what those career pathways, what are those programs that we see in our high schools, and how do they relate to these opportunities that are out there, as opposed to teaching a program and a pathway that's always just sort of been there. And because somebody likes teaching it, or because kids think they might want to do that one day, we can offer some of those, but we're going to have to be much more intentional in it, looking at what those opportunities are, such as with Hyundai and those others. And how do we then back out that and prepare those students so that they can look at the fact that I might be able to make $50,000 a year coming out of high school here. Um, so we want, to, we want to look at it that way so we can prepare for this success. So yes, we have those things in place, but the answer is we will be adjusting that and improving upon that every day. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, we are continuously working to expand our, our services and capacity at the hospital on the, on the specialist question. Um, we have been successful. And we, we recruited um, two new surgeons, um, one of the England Basis Fellowship training, and he's doing bariatric surgery at the hospital, using the Da Vinci robot, um, doing complicated other cases. And then the other surgeon we recruited um, is a colorectal fellowship trained surgeon. Fortunately, they both got ties to the area and been um, very successful here. I think uh, patient outcomes have been very strong. Um, the physicians get along very well, which is nice too. Um, and so when you, have a, when you have a very active surgeon doing surgery on an eventually robot and seeing great outcomes and things like that, being able to have um, in those, the colorectal surgeon um, has prevented patients from having to go to Atlanta for services. So again, um, very nice and that's resulted in the month of December, we had our most Vinci um, robot cases in the history of the hospital. So that means we're recruiting more technically you know, advanced um, surgeons and that are able to do um, procedures that haven't been done in our area in the past. But also, um, I'm, I'm very excited that we have um, some medical oncology now in our medical office so, um, they're there um, full time. So um, there for a while patients were having to go to Savannah to get infusion or chemo. And now they're able to get that here in Statesboro. Um, we have like another um, medical oncology group here, um, part of them now. Um, so, so that's been, I think, good advancement from the, from the specialty side. Some we're doing it on our own. We do it ourselves. And then, like with, um, with some of medical oncology, we work with St. Joe's in partnership to, to bring that service here to the community. And we're also working with the radiation oncology group across from State Federal High School and medical oncology trying to, um, our, we have those services here, but they're a little bit fragmented. So how can we pull them together for the benefit of our, our community? So I'm very proud of that. From the bed standpoint, um, unfortunately, since I've been here, we've never had all of our bed staff. Um, so we've been extremely aggressive um, with that. We're very fortunate. Um, we have um, Lori Southern, LTC here, um, Dr. Marrero, Lori also um, uh, serves on our board of directors, so we're in constant communication, pushing each, each other to be better and to better serve our, our community. That's resulted in, um, I think we typically have about 70 students rotating through the hospital, but um, we're talking 250 now. So we've had a, a students of all different specialties rotating through our hospital. And our goal is, um, if we 
hopefully they have a great experience, they're treated good, and they'll come to work here in, in, you know, in, in Statesboro or the surrounding area. We've also left our name there um, in terms of being aggressive with recruiting. If, if basically, if there's a job in the hospital that a student wants to pursue, we'll, we'll pay for that. Um, put them on scholarship and pay for them to go to school and return some, you know, some forgiveness period on the backside. And so that's that's picking up momentum too. So that's a commitment we made as a, as a company that we didn't do in the past. In addition, now we have a new program where we, we pay for certain positions for student loans. Um, so I'm, I mean, from my perspective, I've never seen a community that you're able to get a high level quality education at such a reasonable cost anywhere I've ever lived or been. And I think we're blessed to have that. And, um, and our goal is to have all of our beds staffed by, by the summertime so that we can be efficient in our ER and keep patient throughput. Thank you. You kind of touched on some of this next question. What is East Georgia's doing to better prepare for increasing staff and anticipated growth? So, anything else you want to add? No, I, I think. Um, Dr. Marrero and, and Lori are really, um, they're doing some great things. Again, I, I feel blessed when I compare us to other hospitals. Um, we're very fortunate to be in the, the situation we're in where we have very um, good leaders that are very motivated and have big hearts and want to do the right thing. So I think we're very fortunate. Next question, will East Georgia explore building a satellite office in the southern portion of Fulton County? Yes, sir. We are currently um, looking at all options there. So, for sure, just a matter of when. All right, kind of uh, following up on that, do the surrounding hospitals and surrounding counties have the capacity to also absorb the coming growth? You know, that's a hard question after going through COVID <laughs> um, because it changed things a lot. Um, but I, I think we will. We're going to we, we're all have to expand. Um, but a lot of that's around workforce more than it is, the, you know, the, the structure of the building. Um, and so much more in healthcare, the services we provide are going more towards outpatient kind of driven, where you come in, you go home, you don't stay at the hospital a long time. So that's helping alleviate a lot of the, of the needs too. And we're, we're also just getting better about, you know, um, I'll give you an example. We, we just recently added a lot more staff on the weekends because we, we weren't we weren't staffing enough on the weekends for the ancillary services. So you know there's some delays. So we've had to just get smarter about making sure we have enough physical therapists, you know, enough case managers, work with the nursing homes and health pack facilities to make sure we run seven days a week, 365. Um, so that's just some of the things that we're doing there. But we we will be. Expanding. We have some projects in the works where we'll be expanding our operating rooms, etc. as we recruit more surgeons. It's getting a little tighter um, you know, on, our, on our schedule and things like that. So to follow up on the expansion, what is the possibility of a new hospital coming to Ward County? For example, St. Joseph has recently built in Fuller and has a location in Pembroke, Georgia as well. Yeah, St. St. Joseph has, um, uh, they actually the medical oncology office they build a, a center there um, and that's where it's going to work well because um, patients can get the, or St. Joe's can get the 340 40 pricing um, within a certain distance of the hospital and that's oncology drugs are very expensive so there they are we're um, uh, I'd like to not see another hospital <laughs> uh, but I think um, I think there'll be you know us expanding and also probably some version of a partnership um, with some of the hospitals. I know, you know, um, St. Joe's, we love the ACA, ACA hospitals of the Spain. We, we talk pretty openly about that um, and try to work together um, as much as possible. Yeah, I know uh, Dr. Morero and Mr. Durden have touched on this, but if you want to expand a little more about the working relationship you have with your nursing program with both of their institutions. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I will. Point out too, um, we, we're very fortunate here to, to the leaders of our community um, and the board of directors at the hospital. Um, we were, um, I don't know if you knew or not, during the height of COVID, we were having weekly conference calls with our, our board of directors to, to compare notes and 
talk about how we can work together, what's coming, what's working, what we need to change. And that was um, very encouraging uh, during some of the very challenging times to have all those leaders um, giving us advice and, and suggestions and comparing notes. Uh, but I think, um, you know, we, again, we, we had a good, also a great relationship that you know, I know Dr. Marrero called me on my cell phone one day and said, hey, these students are displaced, we need to put them somewhere, you make this happen. And I said, yes. And then on my team, I said, I'd agree to this, can we do this? Um, make it happen. You know, we, we did, our team did, um, because we want, we want to do our part and you know, make sure we do our part and make sure we have the workforce for, for the future. And I think the OTC, the, the RN grid program, um, you know, we have the LPM program there that we hire a lot in the hospital and then also our outline physician clinics, et cetera. Um, but then have the ability for those those LPNs to go back and you know, get an RN degree and both their career, both their education, and then we'll pay for that. I mean, that's a, that's a really good, um, I think, system for, for our community. It's pretty, pretty unique that it's in a community our size. And that's one thing I'd like to say since I've, I've been here. I'm really, I'm, I'm proud to be here. I think this area has more people who care per capita than anywhere else I've ever been. And I think that makes us special.